thanks, Jazz. I want to start. I want to start the uh, sermon with a confession. I'm, <laughs> I probably should, shouldn't I? After you're probably going to think a lot worse of me, but after 37 years, 37 years of driving about 30,000 k's per year. After 37 years, I got my first speeding fine. <laughs> I, I can't believe 54 years old, I've gone all this time. I was doing 68 in a 60 zone at the bottom of Ironbank Hill. And this little white van took this pretty little photo of me And it cost me $296 and two demerit points. I failed in my lifelong goal of never giving the government any more money than I absolutely <laughs> had to. And do you, know, do you know what day they got me? Boxing day. Can you believe it? I hope you'll still talk to me after today. <laughs> you are forgiven, thank you. It still hurts. Have you ever failed at anything? Of course, of course we've all failed, haven't we? We've all failed at, at various things. We, we fail at our goals, we fail at an exam, we we fail to meet deadlines. We fail to, to please someone that's really important in our life. We, we fail ourselves. But of course, there are, there are trivial things we fail at. Then there are really significant things that we fail at. I mean, failure like, like the failure when you really make a mess of something career-harming, relationship-damaging, person-hurting failure. And, and all of us, like, let's, let's just be really clear, all of us have failed at one thing or another, and, and we do it far more than what we actually care to admit. A black spot on a, on a sheet of paper is still a black spot on a sheet of paper, isn't it, whether it's a little one or it's a really big one. And all of us have found ourselves struggling with failure in our lives, especially those ones we allow to happen or, or, or we're caught up in or, or that somehow they're imposed upon us and we, we're entrapped in this sort of failure. Whatever the way it comes, failure is a fact of life. It's, it's called making a mistake. It's, it's probably called living, really, isn't it? So failure sits heavy with you. If, if failure comes back to you when everything is all quiet, if, if it nags at you and bothers you when there's no other noise in your head, then, then I've actually got really good news for you today. The good news is in the form of this biblical character at that time we've been talking about in the promised land as they move from, as the children of Israel move out of slavery and into freedom that they were meant to enjoy as they journeyed out of Egypt and as they walked their way into the promises that God had made for them. And it's in today's character, and this is the last one in our four-part series, the character of Aaron. So if you haven't done anything wrong, if you've never made a mistake, if you haven't felt that failure defines you, then feel free to go to sleep. Get on Facebook or TikTok or go and have coffee. But if not, then I encourage you to listen up because we might just find something that will help us all as we walk our journey of life. Let me lead you in prayer. Lord, we, Lord, we come before you and at this moment we come before you in a posture of humility. 
Because we are very aware of the failures in our lives. And the many times when we've forged ahead when we should have pulled back or when we've spoken when we should have been quiet or or the, the myriad of other times when we have failed and made mistakes and it's borne weeds and fruit that we never imagined could possibly be. So at this moment, we are an expectant people. We're expectant to hear your voice and in that voice to hear a word of grace and mercy and forgiveness. And so I pray for all of my friends here in the room and those who are watching online at this moment or later that your spirit would be louder than all the other voices and we would know you, the holy God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, another, another part of honesty from my life. I, I found today's sermon very hard to construct. Uh, searching about Aaron is, is quite full and there is lots of information in the first few books of the Bible about Aaron and uh, this period of Aaron's life is quite complicated in the life of the history of Israel uh, and within the context of the spectacular miracles and the giving of the instructions to the nation. So there's a, there's a lot of information here to synthesise and, and to bring, a, bring about. The, one, one thing I will note, which uh, I've dis, I discovered um, in this period, is that there is only one Aaron mentioned in the Bible. So whenever the Bible talks about Aaron, it is this Aaron from the Old Testament that is being talked about. Uh, but the more I dug into his life, the more I realised there was gold here. So I, I trust this is really helpful for you. So, so let me go on with it. Aaron is first mentioned in the Bible when God, annoyed that Moses was reluctant to accept the mission to free the Israelites from the Egyptian oppression, told him that Aaron had the gift of the gab and that he would be the spokesman. The Bible tells us that he was three years older than Moses and of course, they shared their sister, at least one sister, Miriam, who we heard about last week. And thanks to Liz Dyson for bringing us the word about Miriam last week. Aaron, the first high priest, was the founder and the ancestor of the Israelite priesthood. And it all stems back to him. Very important information to understand. The Bible doesn't say anything about Aaron's birth, his early life, or much more about his upbringing. He, it states that he was married to Elisheba from the tribe of Judah, and they had four sons, all with completely unpronounceable names. <laughs> two of who, who died because they disrespected the Lord, and two who took on the priestly mantle after Aaron died. We do know that his brother-in-law, Nashon, was a direct ancestor of King David. Aaron's articulate speeches to Pharaoh were reinforced by the miracles that he performed by his, with his walking stick, his, his staff. And the Bible records that one time it changed into a snake. Another time, and an, an overnight test with all the other leaders of the tribes of Israel, his staff uh, budded and actually fruited overnight into actually full-blown almonds. Also, by stretching out his staff, he brought on the first of the three plagues, the blood, the frogs and the lice. And in cooperation with Moses, he produced the sixth plague, which was boils, and the eighth plague, locusts. Yet, you know, we, we need to understand, though, that, that nothing of, of when he performed in, of his wonders was, was of any virtue of his own or any innate, inborn ability of his own initiative, but only through divine command. Of course, mediated through Moses. Just, just to an aside, you know, I've got to stop at that point because it tells us that, that we really need to listen very closely to what God says. To put ourselves in a place to hear the voice of God and then obey it. The best way we can do that is by simply reading the scriptures on a regular basis, making time straight after that to listen to what God says and then obeying it. It's as simple and as difficult as that. 
Of course, we also know that the two brothers, Aaron and Moses, were already well advanced in years. Aaron was 83 years old when he accepted this commission and Moses 80 years old. When finally Pharaoh yielded to their request and let the people go. And like Caleb, I said a couple of weeks ago, we are never too old to serve the Lord. Isn't that true? Never too old. After the march out of Egypt, Aaron was no longer a central figure in the events, but only a secondary leader uh, at Moses' side. He, he didn't play any significant role uh, in the crossing the Red Sea, the song of, of victory hymns, or the water Christ at Marah. But he also, like Moses, didn't cross into the promised land. He died in the desert. And because both of them were involved in the moment when they struck the rock out of frustration and lack of trust, and God judged them for that. It's the same reason Moses didn't enter either. We also know that after Aaron died, the children of Israel mourned for him for 30 days before they moved on to the next destination on their journey. One one of the first things that we can apply from Aaron's life to our lives, which relates, is around his availability. And I I know there are are quite a few rocky bits in his life, I'm going to talk about one of those in just a moment, but but one of the things you have to mire him for was his constant yes. Yes, when called. I mean, you can imagine... Hasn't seen Moses for 40 odd years and Moses turns up and says, hey mate, good to see you, I've got a job for you. Yeah, sure, what is it? You know, you've got friends like that, you know, they just say yes, of course, absolutely. Yes, of course, I'll help you lead these people out of slavery across several big rivers, through a desert and into a promised land, of course I will. He was just a yes, I will serve. Pretty admirable, if you ask me. You know, I wonder... When I reflected on his life over this week and, and thought about him and thought about Aaron and, and particularly that one which is about his ability to say yes, his, his agreeance with the commands that are asked from his life, I wonder how, how often are our lives marked with saying yes to God? Or, or, or are our lives driven by our own comfort? and perceptions about what, what is right and true and what, what God should be really doing, rather than, than, than a faith-based decision, which is a yes. You know, we have, a, we have a great big God, don't we? Great big God, and we've been learning all about him the last few weeks, so he's delivering the people out of slavery and, and into the promised land, who is possible, this great big God of ours, is possible much more than what we realise. And there's more to come yet, isn't there? There's more to be done, there's more to be said, and God's got more, more things to reveal to us and, and more miracles to do in our presence. And the exciting thing is that he wants to use us, even us, even here, even today. Many of us, though, have a counter-argument that's running through our heads when it comes to God using us, and we say something like, oh, if, if only... If, if, if only God knew, then, then he wouldn't use me because of X, Y, Z, of what we've done in the past. And if, 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 only, if, if only I could get rid of this, then, then I could be of use for God. And we'll see how this plays out in the life of Aaron because we have a God of redemption and a God of restoration and nothing, even your past, is impossible for him. So in in chapter 32 of the book of Exodus, we find the full account of the golden calf. And I had Jazz read out the more abridged version from uh, Deuteronomy just a few moments ago. And uh, what she read out was Moses' twilight reflections of of how things happen, his his memoirs, so to speak. But in in Exodus 32, we we have the, the full account. And to simply put it, Moses was up on the mountain in communion with God, receiving the Ten Commandments. The people down at the base of the mountain grew restless, like seriously bored. Fifth day of a test match, bored, sort of like really, really bored. And they were keen to move. And they were starting to think, 
And, and probably quite rightly so. They're starting to think something has happened to Moses. We need to find someone else to lead us. And they wanted action. So they come to Aaron, the two I see, and they say, do something. Do anything. Lead us out of this place. Help us find direction and let us move from here. So our, our Aaron, and you, you would understand it if you've ever been in a leadership position, you, Aaron, overwhelmed by the pressure exhibited on him, agrees to their demands. And using the gold, and uh, the Bible says, you know, get, get the gold out of, your, uh, out of your ears, you know, your, your brings and your bangles and casts a golden calf. Why golden calf? That's, that's probably a sermon for another day, but probably emulating local religious practices. And quickly, the people have forgotten who it was that brought them out of slavery and the miracles that God has already performed. And so once Aaron makes the golden calf, they erect an altar to it and they make sacrifices to it and it started then to get out of hand, the slippery slope, and they were well and truly zooming down that slope. Let me read you from Exodus 32, verse 17. When Joshua heard the noise of the people shouting, so Moses came down the mountain, joined with Joshua, heard the noise of the people shouting, he said to Moses, there is the sound of war in the camp. And Moses replied, this is, it's not the sound of victory. It's not the sound of defeat. It's the sound of singing that I hear. And when Moses approached the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, his anger burned and he threw the tablets out of his hands, breaking them to pieces at the foot of the mountain. He was so wild. What that sound of singing was and the dancing, it was just a party. Just a party. It was a big party. In other words, they were celebrating their idolatry and they had completely turned their back on God. So let me list a few infringements against God that we find in this story. They constructed an idol. They worshipped that idol. They sacrificed to that idol. The revelry that, they were, that had come out of this idol and the sacrifice and the worship to the idol was clearly out of hand and the Bible here implies some immoral behaviour as if all the statutes that they'd enjoined up to this point had dissipated. And let's just realise that all that was under Aaron's leadership. We've got a term for this, it's called a catastrophic failure of leadership. And in our context, that would end a leader's job, that would end his future's career, his responsibility and his credibility. For Aaron, this is pretty much a, a no-going-back situation that he finds himself in. And if we, if we switch back to Moses' reflections in Deuteronomy and in verse 20 of chapter 9, we find this chilling statement. Verse 20, And the Lord was angry enough with Aaron to destroy him. Let, let me tell you, that's, that's one list, the destroying list that God has that you don't want to get on, isn't it? So let's, let's step back here for a moment. Aaron, the first high priest, the very first high priest, the, the initiator, the, 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 it, it all starts there with him, of the one and only holy God who had led them out of slavery through the Red Sea, Onto the promise, they'd, they'd seen manna and birds and water and all this sort of stuff. Not only let the people worship another God, but he made it himself and, and, and allowed them to, to put sacrifices down before this idol and stood by while they fully celebrated what had happened. You know, I'm, I, I can tell you, I, I struggle to put that into context, the, the, the significance of what that means for us today. It, it's stronger than I can imagine. It's a bit like the first marketing manager of Apple running centre page adverts for a Google phone while the boss is overseas. 
Or, or it's the son of the president selling the company when dad's away. Or the vice president of a footy club amalgamating with the opposition while the president is off with the board on a strategic planning retreat. You can probably think of something probably stronger than that because it is stronger than that. Aaron does the exact opposite of what he was supposed to do, charged with doing and anointed for. It is an appalling failure of leadership. And it's right here for us to learn not about leadership, but about the grace of God. That's what it's here for. I'm not sure, I know we've all failed, but I'm not sure many of us have failed that badly. Like that's, that's right down on the, on the bad eye meter, that's right, right, right on the very bottom of it. I mean, this was a failure of a whole nation, not just of a family or an individual, against the Lord God Almighty who just brought them out of Egypt by all these miracles. But each one of us have failed, and in so many ways, so many times, in big and little ways, we have failed our parents, our children, our employers, we've failed ourselves, haven't we? And, and you know I'm right. You, just, you know I'm right. I mean, silence tells me we've all failed. And we know deep down in our heart that we've made many mistakes. We know that, that, that if people only knew how much we've failed, then they'd see us in very different light, wouldn't they? For Aaron's failure was, was so bad that God was going to put him to death. But there's a really big but here at this moment because I only... Read out the first part of verse 20. Let me read out all of it. Verse 20, And the Lord was angry enough with Aaron to destroy him, but at that time I prayed for Aaron too. You see the last bit there? Remember, this is Moses recalling what happened, and what we read here is Moses, is that Moses prayed for Aaron Moses interceded for Aaron. Moses mediated for Aaron. It was only Moses' intervention that spared Aaron and brought him into the realm of God's grace. You know, what we often find in the Old Testament is a type of what we see in the New Testament. That is to say, we often see a shadow of something that gets to full light later on in the New Testament. We see, we see the genesis of something, no pun intended, and then we see the full-blown expression of it in the New Testament. And I think this is one of those moments. You see, every one of us has someone who, if we choose, can step in and bring us grace. Who steps in between us and what we really deserve. And each one of us has a mediator, someone who intervenes. The truth is, though, that it's through Jesus. And I love this phrase, and I've used this phrase a lot of, a lot of times. Through Jesus, we do not get what we deserve. Praise God. So not only do we get forgiveness for our failures, we get what Aaron also got. We get a future. And we act, we act all the time. See, and this, this disables us all the time. We act like our failure is final. And what we learn from Aaron is that is not true. Nowhere near final. God calls us despite our failures. In fact, in our failures, we see that we need God, and so our dependence on God goes up. Through Jesus, our failures do not define us. Jesus is the great mediator that on our behalf, and his grace is enough to cover that which we have done or not done, and enough to set us free for a brand new future. Praise God. And here's the deal with Aaron. Aaron went on to be revered and honoured despite his failure. That's why it's so significant there's only one Aaron mentioned in the Scriptures. Because when we read this little book called Luke, you remember a book called Luke? Luke chapter 1, verse 5. We read of the parents of John the Baptist, Zechariah and Elizabeth. as a little castaway mention of their descendant. Descended from Aaron. 
There we go. The cousin of Jesus, descended from Aaron. Yet even though he did this glaring mistake and a few others, I might add, God uses him and his name, his name becomes a legacy name, a blessing name, to pour out the goodness, God's grace on generations. Is that what you want? Of course it is. It's what we all want. Do you want to move forward? Of course. Do you want to be released from the shackles of your past, your mistakes? I know I do. If only the government would refund my money because I said sorry, that would be fine. <laughs> I'm, I'm making trivia what is, what is serious, sorry. You can have it all through Jesus. Doesn't that blow your mind? Warm your heart? Encourage you in this day? You can have it all through Jesus. If we come humbly to him, if you come admitting your need, asking for his help, he gives it. Praise God. So here's the great news for all of us. Jesus covers your mistakes. So easy to say, so powerful when it's applied to your life. Jesus covers your mistakes. In fact, he takes them away completely. He doesn't just wallpaper over them. He renovates you fully and 100%. He makes you new. All you have to do, my friends, is ask. All you have to do is ask. And what he does is he takes away his sin, our failures, our faults, our mistakes, our fears, all those things that hold us back and he makes us brand new. He gives us a brand new identity, a brand new family, and he paves the way for a whole new future. The same grace that was applied to Aaron to raise that which he did is available to all of us. You'll never have enough on your own to do it yourself. You need Jesus in your life to see, to set you free and open up a future that is just waiting for you to walk into. My friends, your failure does not have to be final. It does not have to define you. Jesus defines you. Let me say a prayer. Father, we bless you for the characters that have gone before us. We thank you for their... Their errors, their mistakes, and your grace, which is big enough. We thank you that it's applied even to our lives, even at this moment. And we claim it right now. Your forgiveness and your mercy and your grace, enabling us to walk newly into the future that you have for us. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen.